just out of curiosity, you, you mentioned uh, Chandler's little sister. Um, but given given the age and circumstances of the main character, isn't it closer to Kula Flats? Very good. The sequel oh. to the uh, Robert B. Parker's sequel to The Big Sleep. Yes. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really. Re I read it, but I don't really remember it. Uh, you know, amusingly, um, James Caan did uh, oh, Kula Flats yeah. for HBO back in the two early two thousand. In the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. Um, and he was just absolutely brilliant. I, it was. I remember, I remember watching okay. it. I remember reading the, the yeah. book and liking the book and then watching the, uh, mm -hmm. the movie going, wow, this is even better. Mm. The actual movie, the, the, the Little Sister by Raymond Chandler was made mm -hmm. in 1969 as a, starring James Garner called Marla. Yep. Oh, you know this. I do know <laughs> uh, also, elements of The Little Sister were taken for Chinatown. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do you go about purchasing the sequel? Uh, that's a good question. Buy it, buy it. It's it's completed. It's registered with the copyright office. I had hoped to s have it on Smashwords by tonight. I knew that Smashwords, for Smashwords, is a site where you can post your ebook for free, essentially, and they take a percentage. Uh, but you have to format your book each way. For example, you have to actually format your word text for Kindle, for Nook, for iBooks, whatever the format. Uh, and I thought I could just put a bare bones PDF file up. But no, you have to format your PDF file as well. So I, I do have a PDF file available, even though it has not been officially put on Smashwords yet, which it will be by the end of the month. And as a thank you to all of you for coming to see me tonight, anybody who wants one, I will gladly send you a PDF file of the books as an advanced release with my compliments for being here on this auspicious occasion. Wow. <laughs> Very generous. <laughs> Before George Clooney. Before George Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was saying earlier that uh, my goal was that George Clooney approached me and offered me $10 million to, to uh, direct. That's a good goal. Why not? But I, as I said to the people I was talking to, and you were there, I would turn it down. I would do what Stallone did with Rocky. And I would say, you know, myself, I should play them. You have to use me. I want to do it. <laughs> uh, a lot of people have advised me that that would, that would be ill-advised. At this point in my life, given everything I've been through, to turn around, that's, that's some from Hollywood. Now, now getting optioned, you, you know all this. I'm talking directly to you, but you know all this stuff. Well, when, you, when you get optioned by Hollywood, they buy the right to make the movie, and it rarely gets made. So Saul Bellow said that he was he had the best of both worlds because Hollywood paid money to option his books, but they rarely got made into movies because and he didn't like the movie versions. I wanted I would like that. I'm more I think more cinematic I think that well given my attention span is less than it was ten years ago. And given that I think that our brains are being rewired in this M T V quick edits culture. I think something short and snappy would be better. For example, I tried reading the Thomas Hardy novel, Return of the Native, and the whole first chapter describes the landscape. Now, whenever this was written in the late 19th or early 20th century, that was, that was important because not everybody knew what an English moor looked like, and the, and the landscape played such an important part to the story. But now, you know, we've all seen I Hound in the Baskerville. <laughs> we know what a moor looks like. So a whole chapter describing it, I was going, get to this point, get to the story. <laughs> and the same with Moby Dick. Nobody knew about whaling. Melville describes whaling in exacting detail. Because most people had never been on a whaling ship. But now we've all seen, we, you know, we, we can visualize it. We don't need to paint a word picture. Is that good or is that bad? 
maybe it's bad, but it is what it is. Yeah. Tom Clancy did the same with all of the technical stuff. You know? Yeah. I mean, it goes into the you know, workings of this. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Tank, yeah. And it's like, you know. You know, come on, you know, it shoots and it kills people. That's all we need to know. Yeah, yeah. We've like played Command and Conquer. Let's get to the violence already. <laughs> <laughs> What's that from? It's, you've never heard of Command and Conquer? It's a computer game where you build an army and you basically wipe out your enemy. So, you basically, you, you, build, you build tanks, you raise infantry, you march off into the other side of the map. Like, your enemy's here, yeah. you're here, you move all your forces to the enemy and wipe them out. The last computer game I played was Missile Command. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, I'm not up on it. Ruined it. You know, they, they, yeah. How do you ruin that game? I don't know. But that yeah. sounds very interesting. But no, I haven't, I haven't heard you of it. You have to manage resources, build yeah. a base, and raise an army. Well. But there is a lot to be said for the pulp dictum of shooting the sheriff in the first chapter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Another thing I realized after writing it, you can write a story in New York where you have crooked cops. It's a big city. Jersey City's relatively small. The police don't come off in the best light. And I live there. Uh, <laughs> the mayor doesn't come off in the best light either. Oh, new mayor. He's there. So. Yeah. So it's I'll look at the It's been that way for a long time. Yeah, well, yeah. as a bow to, you know. We had to turn our, our, uh, our eyes sometimes. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, as a bow to, not political correctness, but I have the obligatory scene where our hero is warned off the case by the cops. Okay. So I have uh, a sympathetic character who proves to be an ally as a black uniformed officer, and the evil guy is an Irish-American guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my, uh, yeah. So, um, where did I leave off? <laughs> So through the process of writing this, I mean, obviously you had to do, you had to walk around, set some scenery, fi uh, figure out where you wanted certain scenes to take yeah. place. Did you have to um, rewrite the geography at all for any of this? You know, I did. Um, it was necessary that, well, not really, but it was necessary that the villains live in a small brownstone, and they all lived in the same building for a specific reason. Uh, so I, I did alter, I described an area of the harbor where those built, where it's more high rises than those type of buildings. But yeah, I, uh, it's not when I reread it, I said I'm not really doing what Chandler did. I'm not really evoking Los Angeles in the 30s and 40s. I'm just kind of like wandering around. It's kind of like a, like a Bob Hope movie. I'm just kind of walking around, like the, my favorite blonde or something. I, I'm, I'm kind of this wisecracking, the character is this wisecracking guy caught up in this uh, adventure and manages to survive. <laughs> Road to Marrakesh, huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to the Road to Weehawken. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you kept it all in basically one general yes, area. Yes, one general and area city. and within a, a very short time frame, like a few days. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Question. Yeah, we'll give you the idea that to start off with, I've survived, this is my past week, it's been a hell of a week, but this, what gave you the idea, you know, did it tie oh, into making a thriller? Of it's, you know, I'm a big fan of, and I know a lot of people don't like this, but I'm a big fan of breaking down the fourth and speaking directly to the reader. So, uh, um, <coughs> I'm the type of reader, even when I was a more voracious reader, I could never get lost in a book. I, I'm envious of writers like Tolkien and others who write these thousand page tomes and you get transported into a whole realm. I can't do that right now. Uh, when I was reading, I was even as a kid, I was always aware that I was holding a book in my hand. I was reading, in addition to the story, I was reading for the pleasure of the writing. So noises on the street and everything, I didn't get immersed. I can get immersed in a movie. I can get transported in a movie, but I could never get transported in a book. So a running joke is that I know I'm writing a book and I know you're reading it. It's like Road to Morocco when Bob Hope turns 
to the audience and says, don't worry, guys. I read the screenplay, and we survived. <laughs> <laughs> Question. May the script be with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the classic question I ask every writer: yeah. Do you write in silence or do you write with music? I write with both. Um, no, I write in silence <coughs> and I I rewrite and edit with music. I went through the the draft uh, preparation for tonight. Or preparation for putting it in a PDF file while listening on a loop. Two things in the background. I had the, the, the screen diminished, minimized. I listened to the third trailer of The Man of Steel <laughs> over and over and over again. That really sold me on the movie. I wasn't that impressed with the first two. But the third trailer is, yeah. is uh, I will find him. and the, the, It's great music. I don't know whether that music is going to be in the movie, though often the music in the, yeah, the trailer is not being sort. And I also listen to <coughs> over and over in a loop um, the end credits scene <coughs> cast, you know, listing of Iron Man Three, which they take the Iron Man Three theme and they turn it into kind of like a '70s mm -hmm. jazz thing, and the credits are kind of like. 70s cop show. Do you, do oh, you remember? I haven't seen it. Oh, you know what I mean. Yeah. And it's a very good piece of music. Da, 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 the actual da, da, piece of music is called da, da, Can da. You Dig It? <coughs> and it's a jazzy, retro, 70s, funky... Zooming in pictures yeah, from the yeah, movie. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I played that, that happen, in a loop yeah. over and over. Probably driving my downstairs neighbor crazy <laughs> as I read, reread the manuscript. So yes, I write in silence and in sound. You mentioned you did nonfiction as well. Yes. Um, but that's something I don't like to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, I No, no, I will. I will. <laughs> See, because uh, when I write nonfiction, I usually have, I, I usually have music on when I write fiction. Mm. I, can't, I don't want it to disturb the scene. So. Right. What well, is your nonfiction about? Well, as I said, I wrote these books called Everything Books. It was work for hire, which is the lowest rung of the freelance writer. You get paid a flat fee to write uh, 100,000 words in three months. Uh, and you do all the writing, research, and fact-checking. And then you submit it to the publisher, and they edit by committee. And several months later, you get back a box of 20 books with your name on it that so often bears little resemblance to what you gave. <laughs> and therefore, I, I'll own up to making some typos and even a couple of factual errors. But these uh, youngsters in their 20s <laughs> made it worse. And therefore, I, but since my name is the only name on it, I suffer the wrath of the Amazon reviewers. <laughs> what what uh, subjects are I wrote the Everything Philosophy book, the Everything Great Thinkers book, the Everything Mafia book, uh, 101 Things You Didn't Know About the Mafia, and then my two later efforts as things were crumbling around me, like Krypton. <laughs> the opening scenes of uh, Man of Steel. Uh, I wrote the Everything Alternate Jobs, Alternate Careers book, and the Everything Government Jobs book. And uh, after the Everything Government Jobs book, I was not invited to write another book for them. And uh, I went into, I was hitting a midlife crisis. And when you're poor, your midlife crisis usually doesn't involve cars. It's cars and younger women. It involves <laughs> depression trips to the ER with panic attacks that you think are heart attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, it was. My uh, my two cats saved me. And, uh, they do that, don't yeah. And I found them both on the streets of Jersey City. And in March, I had to have one euthanized. Aww. And it was a blow unlike anything Aww. I have ever felt. I didn't have ink in my printer. I was going to print out the cover and the dedication page. And the dedication page, it is, the book is dedicated to Diva the Cat, 2003 to 2013. Because she kept me alive long enough to finish this book. Because when I, and I wrote a passage about her in the book, when I was at my lowest ebb, uh, 
and had lost all hope, I'd see this little cat in the room and realize that there was a life that depended on it. And I couldn't go. I couldn't leave her alone. And it was heartbreaking because I thought she would be around a lot longer than... I had her for eight years. I found her on the street. But the vet told me she was about two when I got her. So she was only ten, which is not elderly. Way <coughs> on the side of people with cats, 16, 17 years. So that was a, a crushing blow that I uh, am I'm not fully recovered from. But I have another cat uh, that my cameraman, my director, <laughs> uh, met uh, today picking me up here. <laughs> and um, I feed the strays in Jersey City. I, I always walk around with a, a couple of cans of food or dry food in my hand. And uh, I like cats more than I like people. <laughs> <laughs> You must love the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook, I mean. Space uh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing but kitties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The internet is made of cats. What? I feel bad for introducing you to Facebook. Now. Yes. Another addiction. You, you, you knew, you've known me for 40 years. No, you longer than that. Longer than we both care to admit. Yeah. You've known me since 1971. No, you should join Facebook. Let's <laughs> <laughs> slow down the, the writing process. Slows down everything. Yeah. But if anybody comes back to me and says, you know, I'm currently, you know, collecting disability for valid reasons, uh, if Social Security ever came to me and said, how many, hey, wait a minute, you just wrote a book. How many hours a week did you spend writing a book? I would counter to them. It's not how many hours a week, it's how many minutes a year. Yeah, because I started writing this in like 2006 or so, and it's only 150 pages. Wow. So, but I believe that I cracked a significant psychological block. Yeah. You've known me since I was writing a book in high school. Yeah. And now I finally finished. So now the best is yet to come, babe, and won't it be? You broke <laughs> you know, that, that thing that a guy posted charging through the paper. I don't know if you've ever seen like, the commercials yeah. where he's doing some sort of a motorcycle jump and he goes through the, through the he broke through that barrier yeah. of the paper. I broke through the green ceiling. Uh -huh. um, your Irish American mother uh -huh. telling you I'll tell you a story since this is confession time. And I I, I have been known to get up in front of groups of people who drink coffee out of paper cups and tell all the secrets of their lives. <laughs> you understand that cryptic reference. Um, when I was a kid, I can't show this video to my sister now. When I was a kid, young, like maybe 10 or so, I told my mother that I wanted to be a writer. And she said to me, don't. And I said, why? Do you, do you, are, you, are you afraid that I'll fail? And she said, no. I think you would be very successful, but I know you. And I know what you write will be weird. And that will reflect badly on me. <laughs> and even though that was said to me over 40 years ago, we internalize things like that. Yeah. They stay with yeah. us. They're, they're in your musculature. So it's, you know, and this woman has been dead for 20 years. <laughs> so there you go. The original book was, the original dedication was to my mother, thank you for making me who I am today. <laughs> but she got bumped in favor of my cat, and she will uh, get an honorable mention in the sequel. <laughs> so, um, yes, it's... What's her interpretation of weird? <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she put it right off. <laughs> what, you, what you've just seen. And then I thought to myself, you know, I've been accused of having a healthy ego and being, being, being somewhat of a narcissist. And uh, I look at my circumstance in life and I say, geez, I obviously loathe myself as much as I love myself. i got to tip the balance of loving <laughs> and lower the balance of loathing and then watch out. If you yeah. figure <laughs> out the secret of that, you'll be a millionaire. Yeah, yeah. The loathing hasn't worked. No, no. Like that, it yeah. never does. Yeah. yeah. It's just one of those things we all do. Yeah. It's a big waste of energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. You end up to your demons like you do with the street punks. Yeah. But like Gandalf, fly you fools. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes, but you got to do that without getting dragged into a pit by a Balrog. Buddy, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've, come, I've emerged as Manion the White. Yeah. <laughs> well, it just goes to show, like, you, like, Gandalf, have found a better brand of laundry detergent. <laughs> that's really what it was. It was a plug for, uh, for game laundry detergent. Purex or something. I don't know where we're on time. What's the, what's the moderator thing? Uh, where is it? Mm -hmm. it's uh, it's 9-12. Yeah, okay. they usually try and wrap us up at 9-20, 9-25. Mm -hmm. Final questions? Final answers, final answers. Yes. Um, a question. Yeah. Since before your star was born, <laughs> I have awaited, awaited a question. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what's the first thing that you remember um, reading? The first thing that I remember reading? Well, probably wasn't the first thing you read, but it was yeah. the first thing that you remember that, that stayed with you. I wrote a short essay in second grade on Romeo and Juliet and denounced it as boring drivel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you for the same way. And it wasn't by, we had to pick a book, I chose that. So I, you know. How was that received? It was received actually not bad, yeah. After all, the teacher My sister, so and so, yes, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it a non as, as I get older and look back at my, my school, and this gentleman and I went to the same high school, uh, my nickname, I always tend to look at you because you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. Well, everybody does, but I was called number six in high school. <laughs> 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 well, that one I don't know. The prisoner. The prisoner. The prisoner. How should we go in the prisoner? I will candidly admit to not having seen the prison. I oh my oh. god. Oh no. What? Get out. <laughs> you are no longer welcome in this club. You're the head you of this club. You do not belong in this club if you don't know the prisoner. For One of the famous mind screws on television. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no. I've seen parts of it. I've never seen the whole thing. Wow, really? Serious, yeah. Well, it, it aired on Channel 13 in 1978, although it aired originally in the 60s. And we watched it, and, and I was nicknamed number six, which I think was a town. Yeah. But actually, thinking about our mm -hmm. high school trivia was pretty good. Uh, did you take philosophy with Father Malone? Uh, I don't, I don't remember you in the class. Well, what I liked about you were in psychology with Father Malone. Yeah. yeah. In, in the senior year, I took a lot of college level courses, and two priests taught psychology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I, it took me years to learn that uh, impressed me is that. They taught it as a straight-out college course. Mm -hmm. They did not infuse any theology into it. Like Father Coyne did not say, here's what Freud thinks, but that's all wrong. You know, right. They just taught it. So in 1979, Life of Brian came out. <laughs> and there was a big hullabaloo. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, pastor of not our parish, St. John, St. Margaret's, for bad kid. We were there. You were there with me. Yeah. To play, I, I go to see it at the Dale. They were sure the priest was trying to not let us go see Life of Brian. So some student asked my philosophy teacher, what did you think of Life of Brian? And he said, it's a great movie, and you should all go see it. It doesn't make fun of God. It makes fun of people. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with making fun of people. Oh, yeah. And I have lived by that precept low <laughs> these many years. So that was actually very progressive for a Catholic school in 1979. Yeah. So. Especially yeah. since uh, you reminded me of Mr. Baisley. Remember uh, the kid didn't have his uh, shirt button on? It was unbuttoned. He had the tie pushed up. Yeah. We had a dean of discipline. Yeah. He took this kid up by the left hand off the floor, <laughs> feet dangling, and felt him across the face. I remember that. Right. Wow. If I hadn't seen him myself, I would have sworn it was a you know, total story. Yeah. But it was like, I was shocked. Yeah, that sounds familiar. And, uh, <laughs> especially after uh, we came out of the same uh, grammar school. And, they were ultra liberal Catholic. Yes, it was the the post Vatican II uh, wolf in sheep's clothing yeah. kind of with a new breeze. Button down know. shirts, no clerical collars. And oh no, they had the clerical collars, but they were they were quite they fancied themselves quite hip. Jeez, no wonder no wonder yeah. some Catholic school I'm kids become atheists. <laughs> well, I'm not an atheist. I I learned about spirituality uh, not through twelve years of Catholic education, but going through. Uh, 
alcoholism and recovery in the uh, 90s, and I, I have a sense of spirituality. I could tell you lots of ghost stories. I believe this more things in heaven and earth ratio, <laughs> since you like my Hamlet references, <laughs> but not necessarily, uh, no, not the way the, the big three monotheistic religions uh, put it forth. But I, I think there's uh, other forces at work, but I don't presume to know what they are. Incomprehensible to the mind of man. We'll all find out soon enough, and I'm in no hurry. Yeah. <laughs> <Not until. laughs> the information is unavailable. Yeah. As I like to say, access denied. A large <laughs> file. <laughs> <laughs> file 404. Page not found. I like to, to jokingly say that, that the, the creator can get on with the business of managing the universe so long as he lets me manage my life. Mm -hmm. The Almighty is AFK. Ah. <laughs> the Almighty is who? AFK. <laughs> away, from away from keyboard. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I sometimes wonder if the universe is a head cack. Shell door AFK. Well, <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> Problem is just between a keyboard and chair. He's what? It's, a, it's an IT term. His problem exists between a keyboard and chair. Or a picnic. Problem in chair, not in computer. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I used to play Missile Command and Joust. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> joust. <laughs> joust! The ostriches! <laughs> Great game. Wow, Missile Command changed my life. That's how, uh, That's how remember Sue? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want this to turn into Falcon Crest? <laughs> you know, I don't remember the story. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, oh. <laughs> I was going to say, I think we just blink the lights. I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Last call. Uh, anybody who wants to give, I don't know how we can work this, but you can like the Little Sister page on Facebook, and I'll send you the PDF through the Facebooks to turn it on. If you're not on Facebook, and you shouldn't be, because it's a very silly one. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, Camelot. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I was. That was I will on second note, let's not go there. It's a silly thing. Send me an email rather than collecting do, 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 do. all of your emails. James Mannion at AOL.com or become my Facebook friend <laughs> and I will send you a PDF file of the book in advance of its publication as a thank you. Now how can we promote the book? Um, ebooks is, you know, it's uh, so new, they say one of the best ways is the old commercial. You tell your friends and they'll tell two friends and so friend on and so on and so on. No, friend. just tell people. Just tell people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell them. I was gonna say something. I <laughs> tell all those. Tell all your Facebook friends. Some tell of them I'd like to meet. <laughs> tell them about me. <laughs> tell all the people you know gossip a lot, and that will go. Tell 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 the, tell the librarians the, the about me. Yeah. Well, right here. Yeah. You know. well, <laughs> like my librarian. Yeah, but the problem is. What? So. My librarian no longer on Facebook. Oh. Uh, yeah, but we wouldn't need a paper copy. He is a librarian. Uh, we, <laughs> wouldn't need a, we wouldn't need a paper copy. I don't know that uh, I don't know that I would have any. I don't know how OverDrive chooses its its books. OverDrive is the uh, is the uh, the uh, ebook provider for the Bergen County Cooperative Library System. Oh, really? System. Okay. Well, my goal is to uh, when I have the means to do printing on demand as well. Okay. So I, you know, let's all let's all stay close, and keep in touch, and and I hope things go better for you. Well, so do I. Because you've been through <laughs> some you've been through some really hard times. Well, all great writers go through that, don't they? Yeah, but uh, quite frankly, I, I'd rather be a a successful hack than a tortured <laughs> genius <laughs> that's. Uh, Living on locusts and honey in the wilderness. What? Living on locusts and honey in the wilderness. Well, that's that's my Facebook thing. <laughs> I, I, I don't put any personal information, although I've just revealed my soul to you. Yeah. And I'm going to put this on Facebook and YouTube, so with your permission. That's uh, But my Facebook uh, location is currently a mad hermit, living on locusts and wild honey in the wilderness. <laughs> but like John the Baptist, I have come out of the <laughs> to address. Old Testament journey. <laughs> <laughs> You've been gathering cicadas. I hear. I hear. Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yes. Although they said they said that uh, they were predicting something like some some trillion yeah, like a plague. cicadas, and they said it's been kind of underwhelming this year. Mm -hmm. You know, the 17 year thing is yeah. supposed to be this, and it was kind of under underwhelmed. Well, they should have to start taxing. I'll yeah. tell you, the locusts have been hit pretty hard by groundwater pollution. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. good. <laughs> well, that means us too. Not, not good, badly, but it's not good. short term solution. <laughs> Not good because locusts are completely harmless, yeah. and other creatures eat them. Right. Yes. So they're quite delicious. Yeah. yeah. So they are. Hundred percent protein. Hundred percent. So they are. They are the full source for other olive oil, especially birds. Olive oil, a little garlic, which, which of course, you know, has been interrupted by all the stray cats. So. Well, that's the circle of life. Yeah. yeah it is. Cats got to eat. Destroyed by spreading cats all over. the rest. The most aggressive, the second most aggressive species on Earth. Cats. Yep. First yeah, one cats kill humans. birds. Uh, My cats well, are indoors. You can't. Was a myth about the uh, no, bubonic plague and cats? Not at all. I don't get me wrong. I'm not you get the cats to get the rats. It was. It was the uh, hysterical extermination of cats during the Middle Ages. Oh yeah. That yeah, increased the rodent yeah. population. Yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah. so you, you answer my. <laughs> I can bleach you. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, I'm sure, I'm sure you'd Checklist. much rather have I'm sure you'd much rather have feral cats around the dumpsters than rats. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining about the cat population. <laughs> I'm just pointing out. It looks like as someone gem. pointed out, if cats ever pay, uh, if cats on mass develop a taste for human flesh, they have the capacity to wipe out the entire species in three years. So, <laughs> so well, the problem is they're too small for that. <laughs> Well, um, don't put it past them. They do kill for pleasure. <laughs> Next. Cats who <laughs> develop neck technology. I know that <laughs> I, I have a theory. If a dog became the size of a bear, it probably would not kill its master. No. I have no doubt that if my cat became the size of a tiger. <laughs> it might, the one I have now, not the one that... Fed well, me. if I <laughs> hit my dish now. <laughs> you know what well, that if, means? If the cat became the size of a tiger, it might not recognize you because it's used to you being bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, if it does recognize you, it would likely still be under the impression that you're bigger because it's used to being bigger. Thank you. I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> you want to test the <laughs> of course, when it goes to sit in your lap, you might get crushed. Yeah. <laughs> so that could be a problem. And on that note. Yes. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.